Catalyst Resources presents another in a series of instructional videos designed to help better equip you to minister in praise and worship. The goal of our ministry is to educate, encourage, and equip worship leaders and other church musicians. Our plan is to impart life-changing knowledge that will increase your ability to minister in your local church. We trust that this video presentation will help accomplish this. We pray a blessing on you, your anointing, and your abilities, that the Lord would bear the utmost fruit from your life, in Jesus' name. Hi, I'm Tom Brooks, and I'd like to welcome you to Contemporary Keyboard Styles. This is Volume 3. Just to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm the producer-arranger for the Hosanna Music Series, which is a praise and worship line. We go into different churches around the country and feature the worship music of different churches, different worship leaders. And through that experience and through leading worship in my own church, I've learned quite a bit about praise and worship, and I'd like to share some of those things with you today. The, uh, before we start, I'd like to just give you a brief introduction to talk about uh, our purpose and uh, just what our goal is as worship leader, keyboardist, assuming that you probably have a lot of input into your worship and also into your band. I think uh, when I try to put in words our purpose, I think really it's to help bring people into the presence of God through praise and worship. Really, everything we need to do Everything that we do should be checked against this criterion. If we're choosing songs, or if we're choosing chord progressions, or if we're choosing people to be in the band, or techniques we use to play, you ought to ask yourself that question all the time. Is this particular song, is it going to help move people into God's presence? Is it going to get them singing the Word of God? And I uh, just want to put that out in the front to get our minds thinking that way. And as we go through and we're talking about chord substitutions and uh, altered chords and a lot of things that get technical, really the whole reason behind it is that main purpose, to help bring people into the presence of God. So just ask yourself as we go along the way, as you're applying these, is what you're doing, is adding this chord, is it going to help further that goal? Another uh, note I made, I made a few notes for you, just uh, about nine pages worth, so uh, I'm going to have to try to buzz through this. I wrote something else down as I was preparing for this. I think we need to inspire people, but we don't need to draw attention to ourselves. I think there's a fine line between um, music that draws people to God, it's a vehicle to get them to God, versus music that draws attention to itself. So I think that's another criterion. We need to inspire people with the music that we do, and yet be sure that it's not drawing attention to itself. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things you could do in terms of chord substitutions that could be flamboyant and great to show off to your musician and friends, but wouldn't really do anything toward bringing people into God's presence. So it's another criterion I think we need to to focus on. Worship is really different from entertainment. You know, there's two different things entirely. And uh, what we're talking about here is worship to the Almighty God. There's a place for entertainment, but that's really not in the scope of what we're talking about here. Now, what we use to do that is basically familiar songs. That's the technique that we use to lead people into God's presence. Most of them are scripture songs that have the Word of God in them. So the main idea is to give them a musical vehicle where they can sing the Word of God so the song has to be simple enough that it encourages them to sing. And all the things we talk about today, chord substitutions, uh, how to use rhythm, rhythmic figures on the keyboard, all of those things need to encourage people to sing. If it's so complicated that it discourages them from singing, then you're not really doing your best. So I'd say three points to make would be, if we're doing a good job, this would be our goal. First of all, it needs to encourage them to sing the Word of God, make it easy for them to sing the songs. It needs to inspire them to enter into His presence, meaning we can take a simple song and enhance it by adding chords to it, adding rhythm figures to it, that will inspire them and cause them to enter into God's presence. And the third thing is to allow them to forget about the natural surroundings, forget about the world around them. In other words, if we can create a musical atmosphere, just like David did when he played the harp, if we can create a musical atmosphere that allows them to forget about the natural surroundings and focus on God, then we're really doing our job well. So those three things. <clears throat> what I've done, I've divided this uh, particular video into three different aspects uh, of music to talk about. There's the whole realm of harmony, 
which would include chord progressions, uh, different ways to enhance chord progressions. The second area would be rhythm, and basically what I'd be talking about there would be keyboard techniques, ways to animate the chord progressions, rhythm, how to work with your drummer and your bass player. And the third area would be arranging, which is really putting those two together and uh, talking a little bit about uh, keys and modulations and all that sort of thing. So really those three areas. And then if we get some time at the end, I'm also going to talk a bit about uh, free worship too. As we get going, one thing I'll say before we start, don't let the terminology throw you off. You know, a lot of people get dead-ended when they get to a musical term that just sounds too complicated, you know, and they can't grab it. I'm going to try along the way to give you uh, easy to remember, common sense kind of terms for all these things. So I'm going to give you the musical term for it, but I'm also going to give you a simple term to remember so that it's not too complicated for you. And just before we get into it too, you need to know that our prayer, uh, I know Kent and myself and really everybody that's involved in this, is that we would make you a better worship leader. We really see the people in the churches, that's the army of God. It's the individuals out there. It's not uh, the leaders, it's the people in the pews and in the pulpits out there. And really your job is to lead them into God's presence. So really you have a real strategic job in the army of God. You know, you're a squadron leader of the people in your church. So it's our prayer that we, this would really help you and help you to be a better worship leader. Okay, jumping into the first category of harmony, uh, what I've done is I've listed out uh, ten areas we're going to talk about. I'm going to list them all, talk about them real briefly, and then I'm going to get into the first song, which is I Will Enter His Gates. Basically, harmony has to do with the chord progression, the bass line, any of the pitched elements of music other than the melody itself. And uh, I'd say really the purpose of the harmony would be to add variety to the songs. A lot of the choruses that we use are very simple ones. And, uh, you know, if you're going to sing a song three or four or five or six times in a worship service, if you don't enhance the harmony, those can get pretty stale after a while. So to add variety to your worship, to try and take them on a journey with the song so the song grows and goes somewhere and just to, to inspire them as they're singing the song. Now, melody is a given thing. Like when we talk about this first song, uh, I Will Enter His Gates. Actually, the title is He Has Made Me Glad. The melody is a given thing. The people in your church know the melody to that song, so you can't really change that. Everything you do has to work into the melody that's already laid out to that song. So if you choose a substitution chord, it can't uh, have a note in it that conflicts with the melody. So that's really where you hang your hat. The melody is a given thing, and everything you do needs to support the melody and not conflict with the melody. So that's another test. As you're looking at substitution chords or uh, modulations, whatever, you've got to be sure that you're always supporting the melody. Okay, I'm just going to go through these uh, ten subjects. These, are, these would be ten different ways to embellish harmony. So in other words, you take a simple song like I Will Enter His Gates. In its very simplest version, uh, you know, the version you would learn from, uh, you know, 15 years ago when the song came out, was probably just one, four, five, those primary chords. Doing it in the key of F, it would be, I will enter His gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter His chords with praise. One, four, five, just those basic chords. The first area we're going to talk about is chord substitution. Now basically what that means is taking those simple one, four, five and substituting chords. Like instead of the four chord, you use the two chord instead, etc. I'm going to go through the whole list and then I'll come back and talk about each one. So the first is chord substitution. The second one is non-chord tones. That would mean adding notes to the chord. Like uh, a common example would be adding a second. Like very seldom when I play a major chord, like if I started that song, I will enter. You can look and see, I always voice that chord with a second in it. There's your basic triad. But I always have the second in that triad. It's just a richer, more contemporary sound. So that would be adding a non-chord tone. The third area would be inversions of chords. That means uh, having the bass note somewhere other than on the root. Like for instance, when I would play that song, uh, you'd stay on the, the original way is, I will enter his gates. Stay on the F chord through the whole first measure. I would play on the third beat of that major, I would go to an inversion. I would move the bass to the third of the chord. I will enter his gates. So that would be an inversion. Anytime the bass moves to a different note in the chord. The fourth area uh, is suspensions. Uh, for instance, at the end of that phrase, a suspension would be, from its original meaning, when you hang on to a note from the chord. Let's say we're on, uh, enter his chords, and you've got F in that chord right there. 
with praise. You hang on to the F before going down to the E. Now there's your basic C chord. What you're doing is you're suspending the F note two beats beyond when you thought it should resolve down. So to do that again, enter his chords with praise, suspension, and then resolve. That's a 4-3 suspension. We'll go back and focus on that. Fifth area is um, what I've called uh, cadences. Basically, and these are getting a little bit more complicated as you go. This is assuming that you've got some basic theory. If you're going to go to a place, like say, say this is the day that the Lord has made, you're going to go to D minor there. Anytime you're going to a, a chord that's kind of a final destination like that D minor is, you can cadence there. A typical cadence is a 5-1 cadence. Like for instance right here, you, you have made me glad. That's a 5-1 cadence. Now anytime you want to arrive at a final destination, one good way of getting there is to play the 5 chord of whatever that destination is. So for instance right here, D minor is your destination. What's the 5 of D minor? Well, it's an A7 chord. So listen to what happens if you do that. Say this is the day that the Lord has made. What it does is it draws you into that D minor chord. Now, taking that one step further, 5-1 cadence is the most common cadence. Walk back one step. Usually the chord that goes before the 5 chord is the 2 chord. So a more complete cadence, actually what I named this category is complete cadences, a more complete cadence would be a 2-5-1. So think of what 2-5-1 of that D minor would be. It'd be E, A, D. So listen to that. Say this is the day that the Lord has made. 2-5 to D minor. So basically, if you take any destination in a song, destination meaning a chord that's going to stick there and it's a you know key framework chord, you can uh, a way to embellish the harmony would be to insert the 5 chord right before that, tug you there, pull you there, or even if you've got time to do it, 2 5 to 1. Okay, on to the next one, modulations. Um, most of you know what that is. That just means when you're going to change key, you're going to uh, move up a key. We'll talk about that. Another thing, uh, as these are getting more complicated as we go, polychords. Now you think about that, that sounds like one of those terms that would scare you off, but basically what that means is uh, when you hear this, this is a song I'll get to a bit later on, but uh, uh, an example would be, uh, see if I can find one and enter his gates, like, I will enter his courts with praise, where at that point I, I have an F triad over an E minor triad. Enter his courts with praise. Another example would be in uh, John Sellers, You Are Crowned With Many Crowns. You are crowned. Where at that point in the chord, you've actually got a D triad over a G triad. So we'll talk about that a little later. That's polychords. Uh, another technique would be pedal tone in the bass. Take the beginning of I, have, I Will Enter His Gates. Pedal tone, if you think back to when organ was the main instrument of music uh, centuries ago, when the organ pedal would just leave his foot on the bass note and let the chords change. That's how a pedal tone got, it named, got it, its name. It just means a case where the bass stays in place and the, uh, the chord moves above it. So here's an example of that. I will enter his gates where the bass stays on F and the chord moves to B flat. Now of course you have to move to a chord where that note fits, but that's a, another technique. And then the last category is just voicings. I'll show you some of my uh, voicings that I like. And uh, basically it's just taking your, your triad, we're in the key of F here for All Enters Gates, taking that basic triad and it, how you spread it out, how you voice it, how you space it out. So those are the basic uh, categories we've got to talk about. Let's go back to the first one, chord substitution, and let's look at I Will Enter His Gates. Now we talked about the original um, the basic primary chord version, which is, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. It's your basic version. Now right away, well, let me give them to you by categories. I'd say the first simple thing to do is take the... Uh, 
enter his gates. Take that B-flat chord. A good way to find a substitution chord is to move the bass down a third. Like if you take that B-flat chord, B-flat in the bass, move the bass down a third, and what you've got is a G minor 7 chord. Can you see how that works? Let me do it in this version right here. Here's B-flat triad, root 3rd, 5th, B-flat in the bass. Move the bass down a third, and you've got G minor 7. Or it's the 2 chord of the key. We're in the key of F, so G minor 7 is the 2 chord. That's always a good substitution. So for instance, if I uh, was playing that and I did, I will enter his gates with thanks giving. Now you could say I didn't actually substitute for it. What I did is I started on the B flat, which was the original version, and then I inserted the G minor seven halfway through the measure. It still really goes under the category of chord substitution. Um, it does two things. One, it gives you a uh, different sound for the last two beats of that major, plus it increases the harmonic rhythm, meaning that the chords are moving faster. So it just gives you a little bit more activity, gives you a little bit more color in the harmony. Uh, you can take that same philosophy, go back to the one chord right after that point. I will enter his gates, giving in my heart. You're on the one chord. In the original version it was thanksgiving in my heart. What I'm doing is I'm moving the bass down a third. Look at it again. There's your F triad, root third, fifth, F bass note. Move the bass down a third. You have a D minor seven chord. So listen to how that sounds again. His gates with thanksgiving in my heart. See that? Um, as I said before, some, sometimes you're not exactly substituting but sometimes you'll start off with the basic chord and then halfway through the duration of that chord you'll make the change. So it gives you uh, a shot at listening to both chords and it increases the harmonic rhythm. Just the chord movement itself increases. gives the bass player a little bit more activity. Um, here's another uh, longer range substitution. Basically the rule for substitution is take the melody note like let's take a moment like uh, right at the end of the first phrase. I will enter his chords with praise Typically, you would go to the, the C note there, the melody. Praise. And the chord in the basic version is C. Well, one way to look at it is, now of course, you've got to see which one uh, is musically right and which one, you know, is going to, as we said, you know, it's going to draw people into his presence. You're not just going to be throwing substitute chords in just to, to show what you can do. But here's a... Uh, a way that we did it on, in fact, this was, uh, this was on a tape that Kent did called In, uh, in His Presence, where uh, this was the opening song. We did a slow version of it. In the slower tempo, there was room for more chords, and at that point, we did, I will enter his chords with praise. So we substituted four chords in the time that you typically sat on the C chord. Let's look at each one of those. Enter his chords with praise. The first one is A minor 7. If you look at it, the C melody note fits fine in A minor 7. It feels real comfortable there. The next chord is D minor 7. The C fits comfortably in there. The next chord is G minor 7 with an added fourth, which is the C. So every one of those chords the melody note fits fine. In other words, when they're singing the melody, you're not going to come to one of your substitution chords and it's going to cause them to clunk or the melody note's not going to fit or it's going to sound off. But there's a way to really enhance that move, especially at a slow tempo. I will enter his chords with praise. I will say. So as you can see, you can take this whole chord substitution idea a long way. Uh, there's a case where we actually substituted four chords in place of one. Um, a general way to think about it is, take the melody note right there. You could just make a list of the number of chords that are in the family of the key of F that have that C note in it. And that pretty well uh, was a catalog of all of them there. Three chord, the A minor 7. Six chord, D minor 7. Two chord, the G minor 7 with an added fourth. That's stretching things a little bit. Of course, the C chord, it fits in there, and the F chord. So any chord where the melody note fits is a viable one for substitution. Let's move on to the second area and talk about uh, added tones, and then I'll play through that one. 
the, uh, the tone that I usually add um, is the second. Take that F chord, I talked about this before. Take the F triad. The note that you want to add is the second degree of the scale. In this case, it would be a G. Now, you can add that second to just about any chord, and it's, it's kind of a, it's not a volatile member. In other words, it, you can add it without really changing the harmony. It just enriches the harmony, and uh, it's really not going to uh, cause any clash. Even if they're singing on the third, and it's right next to that second, it really doesn't cause a clash. Now in minor, it's a little bit different, but look at it in major. I will enter. Do the same thing on the B flat chord. His gates. I'm adding the second to the B flat chord. There's your B flat triad. And there's the C, which would be the second. It just gives you a nice richness to the chord, gets you away from just uh, triads. Now let's keep going and look at what it does to a minor chord that the Lord has made. We're on D minor. Add a second to a minor chord. It's a whole lot more poignant to a minor chord. If you look at the reason why, it's because here's your D minor chord. That second is a half tone away from the third. So you've got a little bit more of a biting clash there, biting clash, than you would have in the major. Look back at uh, F major. There's your second whole tones. Look here at D minor. That E note next to the F is a pretty nasty clash. So usually when you use the second there, it's a little bit more of a poignant move. So you don't want to overdo that. If anything, that has kind of a romantic feel. Okay, with those two in mind, let's go back and uh, I can see I'm not even going to uh, hit the tip of the iceberg on my 12 pages here. Let's go back and look at I have entered and uh, I'm going to start substituting, I'm, I'm going to really incorporate all ten of those areas. And um, I would suggest maybe the thing to do is volume four, I'm going to go into really the last uh, of those five or six areas that I didn't cover, but I'm going to go ahead and insert them in this version and I'll, I'll kind of talk as I go. First of all, just take the pickup notes for instance. I will, for me if I were doing that, rather than just hitting an F chord and singing, I will, to me the five chord of the key always draws you. I always try to use, uh, this goes back to that cadence area we talked about, I will always try to go to a five chord to pull you into the one chord every chance I get. So for me, rather than just hitting an F chord and starting, I will enter, what I would do is I'd start on a five chord. Now this is one of the chords we didn't get to talk about, I'll talk about it in the volume four, but this is a five eleven chord. Another way to talk about it would be it's a B flat, it's one of those poly chords, but once you see what this is, you realize that that term polychord just kind of scares you off. Really, this is a thing that you're pretty familiar with. B flat triad over F in the bass. Whether you realize it or not, you've probably played that a lot, but that's a, a form of a polychord. And it's also a form of the five chord. I will enter. Got the second in the F chord. I'm using a pedal point in the bass under the B flat. With thanksgiving in my heart. Substituting G minor there. Back to my 511 chord. I will enter. Inversion in the bass. Oh, you got two things going on. You've got the second in the F chord, and you got the third in the bass. Just a side note, when I put the third in the bass, I usually leave the third out of the chord up above. And this goes into that category of voicings we talked about. This is one of my favorite voicings, where you've got the third in the bass and the second in the triad. This is an F add two over three. F add two over A. F triad, add the second to it, move the bass to the third of the chord, and that's what you've got. This is going to be the longest version of I've entered his gates you've ever heard in your life. His chords with... Substitute the two chord there. Praise. These are all substitutions we talked about. I will say Inversion again. This is the day that the Lord. Here's another inversion with the fifth in the bass. F chord with the fifth in the bass. Lord. Here's a cadence figure. Two five one of D minor has made. I will rejoice for you have made me glad. I'll just play through the chorus here. Five of 
four, five eleven chord. All those substitutions. Pedal point. You have made me glad. I will. One of the things we're going to talk about in arranging is using this last line. I will rejoice for you have made suspension me glad. 4 3 suspension on the end. Now I could probably take about an hour, I almost have taken about an hour, and talk just about that one song. Really, if you listen to volume four and you go back through and look at uh, all those ten categories, you're going to find all of those are throughout that song. And maybe to get even a more complete catalog, you might even listen to uh, the tape that that's on, which is uh, In His Presence, I think is the name of that one. Okay, let's move real quick, quickly on to uh, another song. Uh, let's go to I Will Come and Bow Down. This is a, a beautiful worship song by Marty Nystrom. Uh, and go back through some of the same things we talked about. For instance, here uh, I'm doing the same thing in terms of the pickup notes. We're in the key of D now, so get your mind all oriented to the key of D. The pickups are, I will come, which if you're playing a D chord, it seems like there's no problem to do that. Although the first thing that I would substitute would be I'd substitute that 511 chord for those pickup notes. I will come. What that does for me is it draws you into the downbeat. And look right there, I've got the second in that major uh, one chord again. I will come. Now in that case, I'm really using it like a suspension because I resolve that second down to the one. If you watch, I will come and bow down. I do the same thing on the B minor, it's a 4 3 suspension. And bow down. At your feet, Lord G. There's your 511 chord again, G over A. Jesus. Bass moves down to G. It's an interesting chord. It's a five chord with a seventh in the bass. And it's a nice walk for the bass player, too. Jesus. In your presence. Three chord, F sharp minor seventh in this case. There is fullness. Now, we maybe ought to stop here and talk for a second. One of those other categories I'm going to get to on volume four is upper tonality chords. That's another term that uh, you can use to uh, frustrate your worship band momentarily, and then you can explain to them what it is, and they'll see how easy it is, and they'll be uplifted again. Basically, this is a B flat nine chord. Now, it's not B flat with a ninth. It's natural with a flatted ninth. So just build that from the ground up. B D sharp, F sharp, there's your triad. The seventh is A. The ninth would be C sharp, and yet this is a flat ninth. So C natural is a flat ninth. So if you look right there, those are the members of your chord. One, three, five, seven, nine. And if you go back to the song, presence, there is full. See how that fits right there? Fullness of joy. Suspension on the A resolves. This is an interesting move right here. There is nothing. Give you the basic version first. There is no one. That's a chord you don't see very often. That's built on the leading tone of the scale. You're in the key of D. This is built on C sharp. But what this is for me, it fits in that category of cadences. Because where you're going is F sharp minor. The three. Who compares? It's just a five of three. It's a five seven chord of that three chord you're going to. There is nothing, there is no one who compares. See that? Now you can use those same rules we used before to enhance that progression. For instance, this is doing a four three suspension on the C sharp. There is nothing, there is no one who compares. To enhance it a little more, and I believe we did this one on uh, To Him Who Sits on the Throne. Um, what we did on that album is we did two five 
of that three chord. So you go into F sharp minor, the two would be G sharp, the five would be C sharp. So listen to that whole thing. There is nothing, there is no one. G sharp minor, then to the C sharp. Who compares with you? Suspension there. Back to that B flat nine chord. I take pleasure in worshiping you, Lord. Suspension, 4-3 suspension on one. So, as you can see, you've got a lot of those same elements involved in there. Uh, let me make a couple quick notes. Think of that, go back to that B, the B flat nine chord. Uh, for guitar players, if you're, if you're a leader of a band and you're trying to help out a guitar player, if that seems complicated. If you notice, let's build it again from the ground up. B, D sharp, F sharp, that's one, three, five. Seventh, flat ninth. If the bass player is holding down the B, put that down on the bass, the chord you've got there is a full diminished seventh chord. Now, uh, most guitar players would probably know how to play a diminished seventh chord. The nice thing about that, too, is that a diminished seventh chord, really, there are only three diminished seventh chords because if you look like a C diminished seventh chord has the same members as an E flat diminished seventh chord which has the same members as an F sharp diminished seventh chord this is full diminished now and an A diminished seventh chord the members are the same because that chord is built of all minor thirds hang in there with me now all minor thirds so really any uh, like if the guy says well I, I can't play a C diminished but I can play F sharp diminished well it's the same chord And really, that C full diminished chord over a B in the bass gives you the same effect of that B flat nine. That's getting a little bit far off the handle, but it might help you if you're trying to explain it to a guitar player. Okay, let's go through this one time. This is uh, I Will Come and Bow Down. I will come and bow down. Here's the 511 chord. In your presence, here comes the B flat nine. There is fullness of joy. Suspension, resolve. There is nothing, there is no one who compares with you. I take pleasure in worshiping. You, Lord. Take it from halfway on out. There is nothing, there is no one. G sharp to C sharp. Who compares with you? Here's that flat nine again. I take pleasure in worshiping. You can turn around the last line. I take pleasure in worshiping. I take pleasure in worshiping. Suspension on the end. So, that uh, also features a lot of the different areas we talked about. The chord substitution, adding the seconds to the chord, uh, inversions of the bass, using suspensions like that last chord there, uh, using full cadences like where we did two, five, to get to the three chord. Let me show you that again. That moves by pretty fast. You're in the key of D. You're going to F sharp minor. That's your destination chord. So what you do is you think, okay, to get to there, I want to use the two chord, the five chord, and then to get to there. The two chord is G sharp. The five chord is C sharp. And then you want to get to F sharp minor. So two, five, that gets you to F sharp minor. Okay, I'd like to, uh, just to wrap this up, I would encourage you to, uh, uh, I'm going to pick back up and focus more on the last series in uh, volume four of this, but I would like to talk a little bit before we go about um, some rhythmic elements. Most of what we talked about here so far is harmony. I'm going to jump over to the rhythm now and, and uh, say a couple of things. First of all, the purpose of rhythm is to clearly define the song. I've found that one thing that makes a difference between a good keyboard player in worship and a real, real good leader 
keyboard leader is how well they define the rhythm. And it, it's, it's really about the same as a good preacher. There are people who really have the word inside them but aren't great preachers maybe because they don't really say it emphatically enough to get the point across. Now, I'm not uh, a good preacher in terms of being able to uh, preach from a pulpit, but I feel like that that same technique is what makes me a good uh, worship leader from the piano. If I'm defining a rhythm or if I'm bringing somebody into a song, I bring them in strong and define the beat real clearly so that people can sing with confidence. If they're not sure where the beat is and if the tempo is moving all over the place, they're not sure where to sing and therefore uh, they don't really realize it but it's distracting for them because the tempo is not real solid and they're not being led real positively. So what that means to me is um, just go back and take a song like uh, let's go back to I Have Entered His Gates. Um, let me just play that chorus. Now this is a fairly rocky song. I'll do the same example again and I will come about down in a minute to show you how to do it on a more worshipful song. But you got to really define the beat. One thing that I do, and I'll go into this more in, in volume four, but I, I sim synthesize in a way the same kind of beat that a drummer would play in the left hand of the piano. This isn't something that I you know, came up with and, and decided to do in analyzing backwards in the way I play. It's basically what I do. If you think of what a drummer does, basically he's got his kick drum on the downbeat, snare on the backbeat. That's precisely what I do with my left hand on the roots of the chords. I'll play the lower note, just a real simplistic version. Say that you're just doing octaves on the left hand. What I do is just imagine that the, the lower note of the octave is the kick drum and the top note of the octave is the snare drum. And lots of times I find that with variations, what I'm doing in the left hand is just exactly the same thing that a drummer would do um, if he was playing his kick and his uh, snare. And what it does is it defines the beat real clearly. Watch and I'll show you what I mean. Here's the chorus of that song. Of course you gotta move with the chords. See what my left hand is doing? Watch the left hand carefully. Fill in the left hand there, draw you in. Little tom fill there. So you get the idea? The main point is providing a real solid bass. And there's lots of times when maybe you don't have your drummer there on a midweek meeting or something like that. There's really no reason why you shouldn't be able to really define worship songs and help lead people. And really what that means is just, uh, the, the analogy again is, uh, you know, somebody who could just say a spiritual truth to you or a preacher who could drive it home. When you play, don't just kind of play and play along. Drive it home. That doesn't necessarily mean just play hard. Um, let's take it over to I Will Come and Bow Down, the other song we talked about. Now obviously I'm not going to bang out that like I did I Will Enter His Gates, but you can still accomplish the same thing by I will come and bow down at your feet, Lord Jesus. Very simple but still providing a real solid rhythm. Get the idea? Um, one other thing to mention in that uh, whole rhythm thing, tempos, be sure that your tempos are the phrases, if you do them too slow, people can't even hold a breath to get through a long phrase. If you do things too fast, they don't really have time to meditate on the lyrics. So in that whole rhythm area, just be sure that your uh, you pick a perfect tempo. A good way to do that is before you start the song, do about two measures of it in your head before you put your hands to the keyboard. You're thinking, I will come and bow down. And then you start to play, I will come. That way, you don't get two measures into it and the worship leader turns around and says, too fast or too slow. Get it going in your head first and then you'll uh, be in good shape. One of the other things I'm going to go into in volume four is different um, 
rhythmic figures, like what I use there is just a simple quarter note thing. I will come and bow down. I'm going to go through a whole lot of different options in terms of uh, in terms of uh, different keyboard figures you can use. While we're talking about rhythm, uh, another song that features that rhythm is You Are Crowned With Many Crowns. It's another situation where I use the left hand to simulate the uh, like what a drum kit would do. I'll play a little bit of that for you. Another great feature of this song is it uses some of the uh, polychords. It's one of the areas that we hadn't talked about yet. We're going to go into in volume four. I think really Michael Amartian uh, probably deserves the credit for having penned this the very first time. Just that whole move. You hear that a lot in pop music today, but I think it first appeared a long time ago on one of his albums. It's a, uh, as I say, we're going to go into it on the other volume, but it's a great way to give chord movement without actually uh, moving off the bass. Here's, a, this is Your Crown with Many Crowns. I'll play through it once. We'll go back and talk about it a little bit, and I'll do a little slower so you can see what's going on. But watch the left hand and uh, watch how I use it to drive the rhythm of the song. Back at the top, watch again, I'll do a little bit slower. You are crowned with many crowns. Look at the left hand. It'd be just the same kind of rhythm that a drummer would do. I'm making a big deal about this point, but <clears throat> you'll find the difference between uh, people kind of straggling around and people that really jump up and alertly stay with you. It's directly proportional to how much you drive the music not drive in a negative sense, but just make a real clear statement about where the downbeat is and where the tempo is. I'll do it once more, and uh, as we're doing that, look at these right hand moves. Uh, the basic thing I'm talking about it here is you've got G triad, real simple. You've got D over G. You hear that a lot in pop music today. Same thing happens down here, E minor. E minor, B over E. Same thing happens here on A minor. Suspension on the five. So just watch that as we go through. This also has some interesting chords in the bridge section where it goes to the minor four chord. I'll uh, go through this time and do a little bit slower and talk as we go. Here we go. You are crowned with many crowns. Inversions in the bass here. <coughs> Minor four chord. That's an interesting chord right there. Goes to the minor four chord. This is an F11 chord to F9. Back to G. The reason that move is so great is because it fakes you out. It it's almost sounds like it's modulating to B flat. You get the two chord in B flat. You get the five chord in B flat. Sounds like you're going to there, and instead you go to what's called the Picardy third, which is back to G. It's another thing we're going to talk about in volume four. Minor four chord, F chord, back to G. It's a real lifting move. Anyway, I just wanted to show you that. That's another example of how you can use that driving rhythm in the left hand to really define the song. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk about, and uh, 
this goes into a little bit of a different category is worship progressions. Now, to me, the, our purpose behind a worship progression is a little bit different from uh, the criterion we talked about for uh, just accompanying a song that they know because there we said that the melody was the rule and you determine all the chords you use by what the melody is. In a worship progression, it's really a different situation. There isn't a melody that's written out that they're going to be singing. Basically, they're going to be, this is free worship, so they're going to be improvising as the Spirit would give them song. One thing to, to take into account here is that the average worshiper has a certain melodic vocabulary that they go to. And, uh, you know, if you listen to a lot of different uh, churches in worship, you'll find that basically they stay right around the, the uh, primary notes of the scale. You know, there aren't that many people that uh, veer too far away from that. So what that means to me is when I'm choosing a worship progression, I have to choose chords that aren't going to mess them up. In other words, if you choose chords that go you know, way out into left field, they're trying to get freed up in worship and your progression isn't, it's not like it's helping them. It could even be uh, standing in the way of them because they go to a note that normally feels comfortable to them and it clashes with your chord and it kind of shuts things down. So um, what I'm going to talk about here is a little different from, uh, I'm not really going to so much give you a progression, a worship progression, because uh, this assumes that you've seen the, uh, the first volumes of this series and uh, Ken also produces an open worship chord progressions where they've cataloged a number of those good ones. My view on this is I could give you a lot of real uh, far out uh, interesting sounding worship progressions but the thing I've found is that the best ones that really achieve the goal which is to release people in worship are the simplest ones. It's not the most complicated ones. I mean it's actually just the opposite. The simpler ones are the ones that work better and help people enter into his presence. So what I'm going to talk about is a way to develop the simple worship progressions. And uh, I'm sure that all of the worship progressions I'm going to do here are ones that uh, Kent and some of the others, uh, the other people have talked about on those uh, other volumes of this series. But what I'm going to talk about is a way to grow through those progressions and take them on a journey. Let me explain what I mean. Say if you're in the key of C, that's a good key to think in just because it's the simplest. So you finish a song that's in the key of uh, in the key of C, and uh, you've retarded to the end, and you're on the C chord. Now, for me, what I like to see, I, I know that this worship progression is going to go on for uh, a certain length of time, and I want to have room to grow with it. So what I want to do is I want to start with the very simplest thing I can, and then I'm going to add elements as we go so that each time there's a little bit more variety there's a little bit more um, spatialness to it and, and you can kinda take them uh, from a very simple place where they are right into the throne room so to me the simplest thing is just to stay right on that one chord you finished on that one chord so what I would do is I would just arpeggiate around on that one chord out of rhythm not imply any certain rhythm now all I'm doing is just uh, doing arpeggios of broken chords. Just that C chord with the added second in it. It's a real simple way to give activity. There's motion there, but it's not real defined. So say you've done that for a couple of minutes. And you might let that just kind of sense the spirit. You know, a lot of times that goes in waves. It might start real soft. And then it might grow in intensity. And then I'd start to add a little bit of rhythm to it. The simplest place to go is to the four chord. All I'm doing is adding a real simple four, four. I'm using the second. We talked about adding the second. There's the seconds on top of the F chord. Music tends to go in groups of fours. So once I start this, I'm probably going to do about four measures of it before I change something. If you look at music, it just naturally wants to go in groups of four things. So this is our fourth measure. Now I'm going to take the next step. I'm going to move the bass up to the F. We had a pedal point C there. Now I'm going to move it up to the F. So you get the feeling of it starting to go somewhere, starting to grow a little bit. I'm just going to do two measures for the sake of time. I'm going to start focusing on those non-chord tones. 
the second there. There's that voicing we talked about. Passing chord there. Now I'm going to start substituting some chords. So now things are really starting to happen. It's starting to grow a little bit. Substitute a five chord at the end. One more substitution. Five chord. Pulls you around. Let's get some inversions in there. Use uh, different inversions of the last chord. With a third of the bass. Think about suspensions now. We could add suspensions. Like the 4 3, 2 1. Now, another thing that we don't do very often in, wor in uh, worship progressions is modulate. If you want to really lift this thing up, do the same thing up a key higher. Okay, and say that that's uh, you've taken that as far as you sense in the spirit that it should go. Then give them a feeling of ending. Just get to that one chord, retard a little bit, but don't drop off on them. Keep giving them some kind of a bed. Just interpret what's going on. You've just been through a journey. You've come to a place of rest. Don't drop off on them. Just keep something going for them to rest a little bit. You know, you're resting by a quiet pool now. You lose the rhythm again think of where you want to go now go to a different progression but just don't don't stop ever keep the motion going say if you want to go to something more majestic but be real sensitive you know if you're in a sensitive quiet moment don't jump keys you know don't go someplace wacky stay right where you are you could take this progression and develop it into something big. There are often times when we go into worship, you know, not in main services, but in nights that we set aside strictly for worship, where, you know, we would go on for, you know, hours at a time, and you really have to know how to flow and, and go through changes. So um, what I would encourage you to do is to take all the principles that we talked about for enhancing harmony and use those to enhance your worship progressions as well. And the main, the main trick there is flow. That's the main word. Move people real gradually. You're like the conductor in this whole uh, worship time. And if you just kind of drop the ball, like, like if I'm playing along, there is nothing worse than getting to the end of a song and going like that. That is like awful. Because what you've done is you've, you've created an atmosphere that they're comfortable in. They're, they're kind of trusting you that you're going to surround them with this music. And to just kind of drop it off, all of a sudden, you know, we talked about one of those three things we want to do is to allow them to forget about their surroundings. This is part of their surroundings now, is this music. So, uh, if you're going to get out of it, get out of it real carefully and real gracefully. Oftentimes, like, I'll walk out of a progression, I'll just kind of be droning on a chord here. and I'll put, like, just a little bit more time between each one. It's the same way I put my four-year-old to sleep. You know, you know, patter and take a little bit more time between each one until finally they don't realize it, but it stopped. And they don't even realize it stopped. You know, you get out of it real gracefully. Don't take your foot off the pedal either. Let it completely disappear on its own rather than stop the sound. Okay, I would really encourage you to, uh, to pick up uh, volume four if you can. I'm going to go into more depth in uh, a lot of those areas of enhancing uh, harmony, a lot of those other things. I really hope this has been helpful for you. You know, my, uh, my prayer is that this would help you lead your people into God's presence, help you to be a better worship leader. And um, one of the point I'll make before, you, uh, before we go, you need to pray with your worship band and pray with your worship singers. You know, the Holy Spirit can do so much. We're talking about a lot of technical stuff here. And, and this, is a, this is a technical video, and I think it should be that. But um, overriding all of this technical stuff is uh, this should not be used without the advice of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's just like medicine and a physician. You know, you don't take it uh, without the advice of somebody who really knows. And the Holy Spirit really knows how you need to interpret everything I've told you today. 
So pray together with your band. Practice with a purpose. And when you get together, pray and find out what your purpose is supposed to be with your band so you're really accomplishing something in God. Amen. This video has been a production of Psalmist Resources. Additional resource products are also available from our ministry. These include instructional videos, various audio cassettes, both music and teaching, instructional and reference books on music and worship, and Psalmist, the Praise and Worship magazine. All of these resources are designed to help better equip you to minister in praise and worship. For more information, contact Psalmist Resources, 9820 East Watson Road, St. Louis, Missouri, 63126, or call area code 314-842-6161.